so I'm presenting a, uh, a topic today. Uh, the name of the presentation is called Fast Data Apps with Alpaca Kafka Connector. And my name is Sean Glover. I'm a um, software engineer on the uh, Fast Data Platform team at Lightbend. I'm also a, an organizer and involved in the community in uh, Toronto, for Scala Toronto. And I specialize in the Kafka uh, ecosystem on the Fast Data Platform team. So as a result, I contribute to a lot of um, Kafka projects, including Kafka itself. I was part of the um, Kafka improvement proposal to add a Scala API to Kafka Streams. I've also uh, worked on Alpaca Kafka, which is what we're going to talk about today. Um, it was formerly known as Reactive Kafka, uh, which you may have heard of. Uh, StreamZ is a, a neat new project. It's uh, basically Kafka on Kubernetes, and it's implemented um, as a JVM operator-based uh, framework. Uh, so I'm, I'm heavily involved in that right now. And DCOS Commons SDK is a sort of the same thing, but for DCOS, running, um, uh, helping to run the DCOS Kafka package on DCOS and Apache Mesos. Um, so Fast Data Platform runs on DCOS, so that's why I've, I've been involved in that too. So let's uh, introduce Alpaca. Um, so Alpaca is a, it started as an open source initiative um, to bring, to, to create a, a project to use ACA streams as the means to connect disparate systems together. And it's sort of a container project. It doesn't itself really have any code, at least not yet. It contains a whole set of modules you can use to connect to various different systems. Um, so it probably sounds like uh, Kafka Connect or Apache uh, Camel. Uh, if you're familiar with those projects, it's, it's fairly similar, except it's using ACA Streams under the hood, which helps users implement stream-aware reactive integration pipelines um, in Java and Scala, and all they have to do is bring in a library dependency. Uh, so you can build these, these enterprise integrations, uh, you can build ETL pipelines, but you can just include it in your app too to integrate with various systems. The Alpaca modules available span lots of different uh, services, and I've, I've categorized them here, put them into uh, three groups. So there's connectors for cl various cloud services, uh, like AWS, there's connectors for S3, uh, SQS, DynamoDB, and on Google, uh, there's a connector for PubSub. And then there's various data stores supported, pretty much all the big ones that you've heard of, Cassandra, uh, HDFS, MongoDB, and then messaging systems, of course. Um, there's Kafka itself that's supported, but also AMQP implementations like RabbitMQ um, and JMS implementations are supported as well. Um, so Alpaca Kafka Connector is obviously the module that's used to connect Kafka to Aka uh, Streams. And it was formerly known as Aka Streams Kafka, and before that it was, it was known as Reactive Kafka. And it actually predates the Alpaca Initiative, uh, which was only started a couple years ago. It was originally created by a, a company called Software Mill, and eventually included as an official ACA project under the GitHub ACA organization. And it's, it's used by lots of uh, people in the JVM community, lots of Lightbang clients use it, and they're, they're using it in production to, to integrate into their, 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 their JVM applications. And in fact, it's used internally in a lot of our projects at Lightbend as well, our open source projects as well as some of our commercial projects. So in Lagom, it's used for uh, one of the options to transmit messages between microservices. And more recently in fast data platform pipelines, um, it's used for the uh, save points feature within that product. And you'll probably hear more about that in, in the coming months. We're, we're getting close to a, a 1.0 release, I think. Um, 
It's, uh, it's used, like I said, as a, you can use it as a single JVM dependency. It just, you, you just have an application, you include a line in your build SBT or your POM XML, um, and you don't need any other infrastructure to, to run it, like uh, Spark or, um, or Flink, where they, they require cluster resource managers in place to run applications. Um, this is just a library dependency, and then you run your application like you would any other JVM app. Uh, we also need to break down ACA streams and get kind of level set on that. So, um, so ACA streams is a, um, a really cool stream processor, in my opinion. Um, lots of stream processors today, like Spark and Flink, I've already mentioned, have really awesome features to support high volume streaming or, or perform aggregations in a big way, like across multiple machines. Um, and they do that really well. But not many of them support this uh, back pressure um, capability. And we're going to talk about back pressure a lot in the next uh, few slides here. And this is, this is a really important principle uh, for, your, for, your, for your infrastructure to support because it prevents cascading failure when, when you have too much load for any, for any one component within your infrastructure. If you have something in there um, that can't handle a lot of load, like the weakest link, it's probably going to get overloaded at some point and hopefully not bring everything down, but oftentimes cascading failure happens and everything comes down as a result of it. So back pressure is important and Active Streams is one of the only processors kind of around that can give you that guarantee uh, and implement it very well. So ACA Streams was originally created to simplify streaming semantics within ACA actor systems. Um, so if you're familiar with ACA, like uh, and actors and the messages and sending uh, messages between actors, um, it's pretty basic stuff, right? And to model complex streaming semantics on top of that is, is fairly challenging unless you really know what you're doing. So ACA Streams, eliminates a lot of that boilerplate you'd have to otherwise write or discover or, or trip on and, and recreate. And it makes it available and you'll find, you'll find ACA streams uh, kind of used ubiquitously within uh, ACA, like it's used in ACA persistence, it's used in ACA HTTP to model requests and response kind of workflows. Um, it's used all over the place um, to, to simplify these streaming semantics. And ACA Streams itself is based on ACA actors, but you don't have to know anything about how act actor systems really work to use it. Um, it's, uh, it's just used under the hood, and, and you can use it just as a, a single uh, JVM dependency and, and, and build um, pipelines without really knowing how ACA works, although it, it does help. So here's a basic pipeline. At the very least, you need a source and a sync, obviously. Your messages have to come from somewhere and they have to go somewhere. And then, optionally, you have these flows and you can have as many as you like. Um, and one unique, unique property of, of, another unique property of ACA Streams is you can support um, loops within this graph that you're creating, um, which is something that a lot of stream processors don't support. So Spark, um, Flink, Kafka Streams all support acyclic graphs, but ACA Streams actually gives you the ability to have cycles within your, within your graphs. So you can have something downstream, for example, uh, influencing um, something up, upstream, a flow upstream, and have that loop if you, if you have some need to do that in your domain logic. So that's, that's a pretty neat feature. Um, So the, the reactive streams specification um, is what enables back pressure. So we're going to dive into what, what exactly that is. And reactive streams borrows a lot of principles from the reactive manifesto. It helps us build flexible, uh, loosely coupled systems that we can use to really scale out. And it, they all, uh, and we communicate asynchronously uh, within them. The spec was spearheaded by Lightbend itself, but it's actually a partnership with lots of big players in the streaming space, including Netflix, um, Red Hat, and Pivotal, all contributed to this spec. And they all have 
a lot of them have libraries that implement the spec, um, just like ACA streams. So you have uh, RxJava and VertX, there's, there's others that run on the JVM and on other uh, language runtimes too. And uh, a more recent event is that the JDK actually now supports the reactive specification as of JDK 9. So we're gonna see something cool in the next few years once the community moves uh, past uh, Java 8 and starts using later versions of the JDK. A lot of these stream, a lot of these uh, libraries are gonna start uh, releasing versions that use this underlying type system. And, and that'll simplify their designs and also make it easier to um, interoperate between them. So let's, let's talk about back pressure in a little more detail. So this is a little demo that I put together. Uh, before we continue, like I said, each one of these components is uh, part of a graph and we call them graph stages within ACA streams. And the graph stage is uh, under the hood represented, has an actor uh, representing it under the hood. So therefore, if you're familiar with ACA, a lot of the same principles apply um, to the graph stage as they do in actor. For example, uh, they all have a mailbox. So this is a mailbox, it's kind of like a little mini buffer for messages. And in, in normal ACA actor systems, when you define an actor and you don't uh, override the defaults, the mailbox is unbounded. It's just as large as you want it to be. And this can often result in um, uh, um, uh, out of memory exceptions if, if there's something producing a lot of messages to that actor and they're not being read in a timely manner. But the difference in uh, graph stages is that we use a constrained mailbox. And uh, you might wonder why you want to do that. The, the point is to, by, by having some kind of constraint, we can actually enable back pressure. Um, because otherwise there, there's, no, um, there's, no, there's no need for uh, back pressure to happen because every uh, graph stage can accept infinite numbers of messages and, and back pressure just wouldn't be a thing. It's like having a river and having a garden hose, right? The garden hose constricts the flow of water. We're doing the same thing with data here. Um, and then the, the third thing is state can be encapsulated within these graph stages, just like actors, uh, so you can model state. So let's begin the, the demo here. So when you, when you run your um, ACA stream, uh, it runs, the, the sync will say, I, I need some messages. I have capacity to process some messages. Please send me some. So it sends a request upstream using that, uh, that communication channel, uh, that upstream communication channel, and sends a demand request. And it propagates up, up the, the graph uh, from, from graph stage to graph stage until it, until it reaches one that can satisfy its, its request. And then the, it'll eventually get to the source, and the source will do what it does and load some messages. So in this example, it's loading it from a Kafka topic. It loads some messages. And then it can now satisfy the demand of the flow. And the flow will get some messages and it will process, it'll output messages and be able to satisfy the demand from the sync and so on. And that's how, that's how back pressure is the, the kind of the, the full life cycle of a demand request to getting messages. Back pressure has, so that in a naive implementation, uh, we would model back pressure as just a demand request and it, it might just signal a need for one message. Um, and you could implement back pressure that way, but you can imagine in really high volume streaming systems, if you're sending a demand request for every message, that's a lot of communication happening in that back pressure protocol, right? Um, and that, as a result, slows down the whole system. The streaming system gets pretty slow. Uh, on the flip side, a push model is just sending messages as fast as it can. It doesn't really care about what's downstream or whether it can keep up. It just is sending them as fast as possible. And obviously that's the fastest solution, but you risk overloading your downstream. So the compromise that Act Streams does is this model called dynamic push-pull. So it's, it's a hybrid model where I, I simplified the graph stage so there's, there's only two act actors at play here. 
The flow says, I can, I can handle up to five messages because I know my mailbox is of a certain size and I can have up to five messages queued and ready to go there. So there, uh, it asks for, uh, it sends a demand request, so a pull request upstream. And the source says, okay, I can send you five messages and it will push those uh, to, the, to the next graph stage in the graph. Um, and it, it can do that blindly and in batch because, it know, because that's what it requested earlier. Um, if we tried to, this wouldn't happen, but if we tried to send another message, it, it would be dropped because there's nowhere for it to go. Um, the mailbox is full already. Uh, and this is, this is basically an example of a fast producer, slow consumer um, streaming use case, which is pretty common in, in streaming use cases. Kafka, so I'm um, uh, gonna try not to spend too much time on this slide, but uh, hopefully most people here understand the basics of Kafka. It's a distributed stream processing platform. It has a relatively simple architecture and it relies on the applications to be a bit, smart, a bit smarter about how they interact with Kafka to create sort of complex messaging systems. But at its basic core, it's, it, has, it contains topics. Topics have one or more partitions. A partition can be replicated zero or more times. And it's high volume because of that, partition, that partitionable nature. Partitions can be spread across the Kafka cluster. So you can have clients connecting to them and utilizing the full resources of the clients and the brokers uh, more effectively than just having them on one machine. Um, it's fault tolerant because of replicas and consistency guarantees you get when you're producing or when you're reading. And it does uh, disk persistence of these messages. And it's fast for lots of reasons we don't have time to get into. One of the main ones is zero copy, the zero copy design. Um, so it, when you produce a message, it has one representation in, in memory only. It doesn't get copied around as it needs to. Uh, for, for whatever reason. So there, the one representation is there, and theoretically a consumer can read it as soon as it pops up in memory. So it's, it's pretty hard to make a system any faster for, for a streaming use case, because it's, it's literally using the same memory reference to pull the, that same message. Uh, but obviously that depends on consistency guarantees and so on of the clients. And other things that make it fast are its use of page cache on the server and its append-only log, but we don't have time to get into those. Um, so how does Alpaca Kafka compare to Kafka Streams? Um, if you're, if you're uh, familiar with Kafka Streams, it, it's sort of similar in the fact that it can be used as a just a single line dependency like Alpaca Kafka. Um, but Alpaca Kafka has certain advantages. And we'll, we'll see some of Kafka Stream's advantages later on in this presentation, but let's call out Alpaca Kafka's first. So um, obviously building back pressure aware integrations is one of those things. Um, just because um, Kafka itself doesn't support back, back pressure, and we'll see an example of that in a second. Doesn't mean that other parts of your overall pipeline might have a need for it. Um, your pipeline probably spans more than one machine, more than one application. So having back pressure awareness at some, um, uh, for most of your infrastructure is, is certainly a good thing. Uh, it supports more complex event processing options than, than Kafka Streams. It integrates really well with actor systems, and we'll see how we can use those to build really, um, uh, uh, we can do extremely complex event processing. And like I said before, we can, we can create complex graphs. We can support like cyclic loops and things like that. Uh, so this is a, the first code page, code slide. So this is just an example of how you set up the clients um, so a consumer is like a source and the, the producer is like a sink. Um, if you're familiar with setting up Kafka clients, this should look pretty easy. This is all in documentation. Um, the more interesting part is the program itself. So this is a uh, complete Stream, or Alpaca Kafka Alpaca Streams program. Um, it has a source. It's a committable source. You don't need to know what that is at the moment. Uh, but it's one of the sources available with uh, Kafka. 
sorry, the, the alpaca Kafka. Um, it has a topic subscription, and it has some sort of transformation layer. In this case, it's, it's not doing anything other than uh, passing along the consumed message into a producer message and sending that along to uh, the sync. Um, so this is a complete consume, transform, produce workflow. Where we're consuming from one Kafka topic, transforming it, putting it back into an, another Kafka topic. And then the uh, controlled shutdown stuff. This is just a, a the, there's easy ways to shut down the stream to drain it of any outstanding messages that haven't been committed or or haven't been produced yet. Um, so you can you can do that very easily too. So I'm going to go through a bunch of Kafka features. Um, we're going to get into the guts of how they work, and hopefully, hopefully you guys find that interesting. I think that's important in order to understand how to build these applications better. So we're going to go into several Kafka features um, in a fair amount of detail. So we'll, the first one is consumer groups. So consumer groups are uh, what we what we use to create. Uh, really easy performance scaling of consumers. So these are the these are the things consuming messages from Kafka. Um, it's important to have some sort of load balancing solution because because uh, Kafka is a basically a big distributed queue. It can you can have extremely high throughputs to these topics, and we can't just have one like single machine consumer uh, that can keep up with that load potentially. So consumer groups are the implementation that let it spread load across multiple potentially machines, right? As instances of these uh, consumers run on different machines in your cluster. Um, so this this example, this is a uh, this screenshot is a, from a tool called Kafka Offset Modeler, and this bottom line is ooh, I got it works uh, is I think the color green. I'm not sure, and. It's basically showing where the where the application is in the offset log that it's consuming from, and then this blue line is where the Kafka offset log actually is. So you can see that it's behind; it's at a lower offset, and this divide is growing over time. And that divide is the lag, and it's represented by this red line. And then we're just uh, this particular example is showing where the consumer had some sort of event happen where it was able to catch up really quickly. Uh, probably another consumer was added to so it could handle more load. And when that happened, what, what we want to see is it be really close in line with the latest uh, um, offsets available in the log, and we want to see this red line go down to uh, approaching zero. We want as little lag as possible to, to stay as near to real time as possible. So this is another representation of how the, the consumer group is uh, working at a high level. So we have these uh, producers, we have end producers, and their combined throughput to this topic is like 10 megabytes a second, let's say. And we have three consumers that on average can, can consume at three megabytes a second for a total of nine megabytes a second uh, consumption rate, which is lower than 10 megabytes a second. So we're going to see this sort of uh, behavior in that um, uh, in, in this uh, use case. So that's no good. We don't have back pressure like in Active Stream, so we can't tell the producers to slow down. And there's lots of use cases where we might not actually want to do that. Maybe we don't have control over these producers. Maybe we're an IoT company, and these are all of our Apple Watches sending telemetry. We don't want them to slow down. We just want them to send data as, as fast as they can, and, and we'll catch up when we, when we can. Uh, and that's what Kafka is good at. It's it's good at absorbing the spiky load, right? Um, so the solution to this problem in, in Kafka is to add another consumer. And when we do that, it joins the consumer group. A rebalance happens so that load is evenly distributed across all these consumers. Um, and now we have a new aggregate uh, consumption rate that's higher than the pr production rate. And eventually, the the lag will will catch up. Or will the lag will reduce to zero and, and will catch up to the latest offsets. Uh, so there's a bunch of different tools you can use to monitor consumer lag. Uh, I showed you Kafka Offset Monitor, an example of that. If you use Kubernetes and, and you use Prometheus, there's um, the Kafka Exporter, which can show you these stats 
as a Prometheus health endpoint. And you can graph it however you plan, you, you do that kind of stuff. And then another option is to use the Kafka client itself, which exposes these metrics um, internally. Um, and Alpaca Kafka also exposes them too. So let's get into the guts of a consumer group and how it works. So there's, there's lots of, there's four main components to it. We have the, the clients themselves. So a consumer group is one or more of these uh, instances of a, of a consumer uh, client. And um, you can generally scale these as, as high as you like. The only thing that's limiting them is basically how many partitions you have available. Because each, like I said before, each, part, each um, client is receiving a distinct set of partitions. We don't have any clients uh, reading the same messages. Um, they're all taking a share of the load. Then we have the consumer group leader. And this is a sub-process that happens on one of the clients. And it, it's, it's basically the, the brains behind how these partitions are assigned to the clients. Um, it has a, a, it's called the partition assignment strategy. And there's default ones that come with Kafka that most people use. But uh, by having it in the client, you have an easy way of actually providing your own. So if you, if you had some kind of custom business logic to do this assignment, you could implement your own, include it in your clients. And that's why, that's why this process exists in the client in the first place. If you had to put that into the broker, then you'd potentially have to have, you'd have like this upgrade nightmare where you'd have to take down the broker, add like a new library dependency and bring it back up. So this was, this design decision was to help mitigate situations like that. So the consumer group leader makes the decisions, but the consumer group coordinator is what actually tells all these members of the consumer group what, what to do. Um, so it, it, it communicates with all of the, the clients, it accepts, uh, it will kick clients out when, they, when they're no longer healthy and they're not sending heartbeats. Um, it'll accept when a client wants to join or, or leave gracefully. Um, and then the last piece is this offset log, which will uh, basically store the position we're at for, the, for this consumer. Um, and if you want to store your offsets in Kafka, that's where they end up. So let's, let's go through the rebalance um, demo here. So, the, so we have these three clients. They, they have their partitions. They're consuming happily. And then client D comes along. And it's like, I'm in the same group as you guys. Can you please let me join your, your, your cool consumer group? So it joins. Um, it sends a request, a join request to this consumer group coordinator. And then it passes that request to consumer group leader. And remember, this has the brains on uh, deciding what, how this client to partition assignment uh, should look like. So it does that for the consumer group coordinator and sends it back. And then the coordinator sends it to all of the members of that consumer group. Um, so this is basically, the, these partitions have been rebalanced. Some clients don't have the partitions they had before, and this new client will, will get some uh, partitions. And it's about as even, like depending on your strategy, it's about as even as it can be. That's the end goal, is that you distribute this load effectively, right? Um, and then something happens before everything is good. The clients have an opportunity to um, uh, persist their current position or at least they're signaled that, hey, a rebalance is happening. Um, do you want to do anything with, uh, do you want to do anything with your, your latest state? Like, do you have messages consumed that you haven't committed yet or whatever? So there's, there's a hook that you can use um, called topic partition revoked. And it's the event handler that is exposed in Alpaca Kafka as well. And one example of what it might do is that it'll say, oh, I want to commit my position for all these partitions I no longer have assigned to me so that I don't have to reprocess that message when it's assigned, that partition's assigned to another um, client. And then once that's done, everything can, can start, can resume again with these new assignments. 
So here's some code on how you do that in Alpaca Kafka. So you have uh, a, an actor here. This is an ACA actor. Uh, it doesn't matter where, where this actor is, what it's called. As long as it uh, is able to handle these two <coughs> messages, which are defined by the Alpaca Kafka library itself, then uh, it's good. And it can have, this is where your business logic goes to do whatever you want to do when the rebalance is, is occurring. Um, so like in the example, you could commit messages that are outstanding to the consumer offset log. And then you just, you just pass it into the topic subscription, which gets passed into the, uh, the alpaca source when you, when you create your stream. And this is everything I just said. Uh, transactions. So this is the, uh, the, the fun part of the presentation. I'm going to try and break it down as much as I can, but it's a, it's a really complex topic. It, it's a complex implementation, so that's the bad news. But the good news is that it's really easy for the end user to use transactions. But hopefully you will gain an appreciation for what transactions do uh, by understanding some of, the, um, some of the things that go into making it work. And I tried to break it down as much as I could. I apologize if I, I, if I lose anybody, but I'll post, I'll post some resources that you can read, the, the original Kafka improvement proposals that are really good at explaining this if you want to know, um, if you want to refresh it. So Kafka transactions are um, basically enable atomic rights to multiple topics and partitions. And any messages that are processed within a transaction um, uh, and successfully written. So uh, a transaction um, is only complete once everything is successfully written and we, we, commit, we commit it. Um, it was introduced in Kafka 011 in uh, June of last year. And the, these types of semantics weren't really possible before that. Um, for a number of reasons that we'll, we'll get into shortly. Um, so all, all messages included in a transaction, uh, this is what I was trying to say uh, five seconds ago, are either committed or they're, they're not. So if some, some kind of event happens where the messages in a transaction uh, have been kind of partially produced to a, a, a topic uh, and we can't produce any more for some reason uh, or some other error happens, then uh, they'll all be rolled back. Uh, so anything partially committed will be basically rolled back. And Kafka calls this form of processing exactly once, which is a big, big can of worms. Um, and if you, if you talk to anyone at Lightbend about exactly once message delivery semantics, you, you, you probably regret doing so. Because um, <laughs> they'll tell you all about it. Um, so I'm going to try and break down what why that's an issue. So first, uh, so the message delivery semantics, the, the basic three options in Kafka documents are at most once, at least once, exactly once. At most once is like, I'm firing off messages. I don't care if you can process them fast enough. You're just getting them or, or whatever. And I, I, I'm not waiting for acknowledgments. Uh, so you can, this is, you can think of this, a good example is uh, UDP, right? Uh, Game servers, clients and, and game servers use UDP often because they don't, the, the game client doesn't care about um, you know, receiving every packet of information, it just cares about the latest state of, of information. So if you have a use case like that where you only care about the latest data and something, you might have lost something five seconds ago but don't care, then you want to use it most once semantics because that's the most performant option because you don't have a whole ton of boilerplate that we're going to get into. Uh, next few slides. At least once is, um, I'm going to wait for that acknowledgement. Um, I'm going to send a message and wait for an acknowledgement. And if I don't receive that acknowledgement, then I'm going to retry sending that message for whatever my retry strategy is. And hopefully get it there at least once. Um, but possibly it could end up being there more than once because um, uh, maybe I didn't receive an ACK, but it ended up uh, being persisted by that sync anyway, and now there's two messages or three or however many messages um, that got retried. And exactly once is the, the holy grail. That's an open clip art holy grail there. Um, 
And it's the ideal situation that most people would want, right? Like it's, we process the message once, we send it once, and it gets received once. Like what's the problem? Um, and the, the problem is it's just not possible to do that. Um, so if, if you ever took an IT class where you, you're talking about networking and you're talking about the TCP protocol, then you probably had you know, a slide that, that talks about the two generals problem or the Byzantine generals problem that basically says uh, exactly once message delivery is impossible between two parties where failure of communication is, is possible, right? Like the, the network itself can, can fail and we can have network partitions. Um, and that, that's true of almost to any, you know, kind of communication between two points. So this is true at a low level. Um, TCP, you know, can't, can't give you this guarantee at a low level, protocol level. But we can, we can fake it at a higher level. And we can call that exactly once processing. So what we do when we fake it is we're basically saying, uh, the, the phrase I, I like to say is, it's exactly once processing is at least once message delivery with effective, effective item potency guarantees at the sink. So what that means is, is three things. We will retry until we get some kind of acknowledgement from the sink, so just like at least once. We have some sort of item potent sync, so it's deduping, deduplicating messages, any potential duplicate messages it gets. And we're enforcing that we only process that source message, that message once. And that's basically what exactly once is doing in, in Kafka. Um, so to make all this work, we have several different components. Uh, we have the transaction coordinator, which is very similar to the consumer group coordinator and it's managing all the states of active transactions in your cluster. We have an internal transaction log, which is similar to the consumer group offset log. It's an internal kind of meta topic in Kafka. We have these control messages, which we'll, we'll talk a bit more about. Oh, you can't see them. Oh, there they are, yeah. These, uh, these guys are control messages. And um, that, that's helped you, that's used to understand like when messages in the, the sync are, are fully committed. And then we have a transaction ID, which is similar to a consumer group ID, which differentiates different transactions, transactional applications from each other. And then the final piece is called the epoch ID, and it's, this is a, a monotonically increasing number, and for what, it, what it's trying to do is guarantee that we only have one application with one transactional ID running at any given time. We can't have two of them running with the same ID, otherwise we're gonna trample one another and we're gonna lose all the wonderful guarantees that uh, transactions give us. So the epoch is increased every time that uh, a new application tries to join with this ID. So if there's one running and another one tries to join, uh, Kafka is going to invalidate the current running transaction of the old one, roll back that transaction, then the new one, new application is going to run from the last successfully committed transaction. Uh, I know that was a huge amount of information. Hopefully, some of it stuck. Uh, here's, but and this is where we're going to break it down a bit more, and hopefully, uh, it'll make more sense. So there's, there's three features. There were a lot of features that had to be implemented as different Kafka improvement proposals to make transactions work. It wasn't one, just one big kind of development effort. So item potent producers is the first one. And this, this should be pretty easy to understand. This is a, a simple demo where the, the client is sending a message, a key and a value, uh, and then we have two pieces of metadata. We have a, a sequence number, which is another monotonically increasing number and it's assigned for every partition we're producing to. So there's this sequence of this, this counter for each partition we're producing to. And then we have a producer ID that's assigned to us from the broker and it's like a session ID you can think of it like. So we send these pieces of information to the broker, it persists them into our partition uh, with that metadata. And now the broker is expecting uh, the next message to have a sequence number of one. It's gonna increment it and expect the client to send that. But what if something happens here and the acknowledgement that this message was persisted fails? 
then the client um, has no idea that it was persisted. So naturally, it's going to retry sending that message. And it's going to have the same metadata. But instead of throwing up its hands and the broker saying, I can't do anything with this, um, it says, oh, that's cool. This is a duplicate message. You just need to not worry about this message anymore. Stop sending it and move on to the next one. And that's, that, that's all it is, basically. And it's, it's a pretty powerful feature um, that, that it's just one component of, of how, that what, what makes transactions work in Kafka. The other thing, the second thing is the, this atomic write across partitions is important. So this is, this is used, one example of where this is used in transactions is part of a two-phase commit. So if you uh, heard of, uh, you probably heard of the two-phase commit protocol if you've worked with any kind of distributed system in the last 20 years. It's a fairly old protocol. Um, and what, what's happening is in the first phase of that commit, uh, we're preparing a transaction to be committed. So, the, so we, we basically just, all that's happening is the transaction log is incremented with a uh, message saying, hey, the, the, we're, we're waiting to receive a commit or an abort, a rollback from the client. And then the second phase is that actual commit from the, committing the transaction from the client. And that, that kicks off this atomic write which is sending, it's updating transaction log with, you know, the, that the transaction is complete. All of the consumed messages from the subscription have been um, consumed successfully. And all of the messages were, all of the uh, partitions we're producing to, we're putting this kind of placeholder in them, this control message saying, hey, this, all the messages behind this have been successfully transacted in the transaction. And this is all done all or nothing. Um, and the, the control messages are useful for the last part of this, this puzzle, where uh, if, we have, if we have clients downstream from the transactional work, workflow, so this is, this is consuming messages that have been involved in a successful transaction, it needs to know when it can start consuming those messages. So those control messages are how it does that. Um, along with this uh, consumer config you probably can't read, called isolation level. Um, and it can have two, two uh, configurations. It can be read committed, which basically recreates or you, implements that workflow I just described where it waits until these control messages arrive before it consumes. Or it can be read uncommitted, which is basically how it always worked before. And this, this reveals the biggest problem with transactions. So there's, there's a lot of things going on, but generally speaking, transactional workflows aren't that expensive in, in Kafka. The, the kicker is when um, the control message takes a long time to, to show up. If you have lots of stages in your pipeline, then every transactional stage, uh, however long your transactions last on average, you have to add all those up and you're, 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 the last stage in your pipeline gets slower as a result. So when I'm talking about pipeline, I'm talking about like a pipeline over many systems with topics in between. Um, this, this slows down over time because we, the implementation in Alpaca Kafka and Kafka Streams for this is basically to automatically commit um, on some kind of predefined interval, so 100 milliseconds. So a maximum of 100 milliseconds can happen in each one of these steps. Um, and obviously that can slow things down. So you want to keep this as low as possible, and you want to keep your number of transactional workflows to a minimum to avoid having uh, really late data and a lot of lag. Um, I got to speed ahead here. Oh, uh, so this is the code. Um, as you can see, it looks almost identical to uh, the app we showed before. It just has a different source, um, a different sync, but, and, a, and now it has a transactional ID, but that's pretty much the only difference. Uh, running out of time. Complex event processing is basically uh, managing, uh, being able to pipe our, our messages through some sort of really complex you know, web of business logic, right? Um, and the best way to do that, in, in my opinion, with ACA Streams is, is to integrate it with an ACA actor system. And, and Colin has a great presentation on this and a blog post. You should check that out. But 
Active Streams has a really nice way of, uh, oh, my clicker ain't working. Oh, Norton's telling me to install an update. <laughs> not now. <laughs> not, not now. Okay. Um, so here's a, here's a really crappy representation of an actor system. You know, all the things that could be happening within it. Basically, what, uh, to integrate, we, we use this thing called the ask pattern uh, within ACA. And it, it models basically an asynchronous request and response. So it, it looks like a future, a Scala future. And we have basically, here's the, um, we have some actor that we're sending our messages to. It could be a local actor, it could be an ACA cluster somewhere, it doesn't matter where it is. We just need an actor ref that we're using here. And then we're, uh, we're defining this parallelism factor because we, we want to constrain how many messages we send to it asynchronously at any given time. We don't want to overload it because it can have potentially unbounded mailbox size. So we want to constrain it and we, we do it by this parallelism factor. And that, by doing that, we, we, we can propagate back pressure through this whole integration as well. So that's really important. Um, and the last thing is uh, per persistent stateful stages. So this is sort of an experiment um, that doesn't really uh, work very well because uh, there's no real support for it yet. But theoretically, you can create stateful, um, persistent stateful stages by, by using event sourcing within your ACA stream. So if you're familiar with ACA, uh, event sourcing, you, you have some sort of request, if you're like DDD terminology, sorry, I know I'm going really fast. Uh, and you have a command query or query come in, you respond to it somehow, emit an event, that's this uh, uh, orange, whatever color that is, and then it gets put into an append only event log. And we're doing this because this is fast to append to an event log, and it makes uh, um, recovery really easy because the event is basically triggering this, this state change, and if we have a failure and we lose this state, we can replay the event log uh, to recreate that state. So we basically just pipe it up through this uh, persistence journal and recreate the state uh, because basically using the same way we do in a running stream. Uh, so this doesn't exist. It's by, there's a proposal for it by a really brilliant guy, Martin Krasser, who's active in uh, uh, this space and ML, the ML spaces and lots of spaces. And he's got uh, this proposal, and he put uh, uh, the proposal on ACA Meta, which is where they talk about these types of things, but it hasn't had any activity for about a year. So I'm sure there's a, some enterprising individual in this room that's gonna look at this project and, and pick it up, I hope. Um, and this, is, this should be familiar to people who, who know Kafka Streams, because it's very <laughs> similar to how Kafka Streams implements K tables and all that. And if you, if you need this kind of thing, just use Kafka Streams, because it's really good at it. Um, and I, I don't have time to really talk about that more, unfortunately. So to conclude, um, Alpaca Kafka Connector is just one tool in a large toolbox of tools that you get with ACA and ACA Cluster and ACA Core and all these things. And ACA Streams is a great way to kind of integrate uh, components of your system together. And it's ubiquitous within ACA and Play and Legom. And you can use these things to build any kind of fast data platform stream, big fast data streaming platform you want. Um, you just need to uh, look down at all those tools on the ground, pick them up and put them together. So I hope I've inspired some of you to, to try doing that with ACA Streams and, uh, and good luck. And thanks for listening. Uh, kind of two things. Uh, one, uh, you had uh, a particular Kafka setting, max in flight messages equal yeah. to one. So I'm assuming you're doing that in order to avoid any kind of ordering problems in case of failures on your on your producer. Exactly. Rights. Yeah. Okay. So that, that so so max in flight messages is a, con a consumer property or producer property rather that gets set for us automatically with idempotent producers to avoid that problem of potential messages being out of order. So in addition, um, for the transaction support, right, um, a, a big pattern is that uh, we're, uh, a lot of people are not storing offsets in Kafka and they don't do commits back to Kafka. 
um, what we do is we take our, our offsets and we store them with our state. And that way, from our state perspective, we can do dedupe yeah. as we get messages in. Yeah. And we do not store our state in Kafka. And actually, a lot of people are not doing that as well, right? Or other, other systems. So the Kafka promise for transactions is only if you're doing everything we can, within yeah. Kafka. What are your recommendations as far as trying to do transactional stuff where not everything is in Kafka? Uh, like I said, you can you can do anything. You can implement anything you like. Um, if you already have a system that works like that, that design that uh, recommendation has been around for a while in the Kafka documentation, even before transactions existed. Storing offsets with your state in an atomic write, right? And if that works for you, that's that's great. The what transactions in this the transactions I was talking about today just eliminates a lot of potential boilerplate that you would otherwise have to write, um, like things like that deduplication and, and whatnot. And if you can, if, you, if you're comfortable taking advantage of storing your offsets in Kafka and, and everything else that comes with it, then as a result, you're, you can simplify a lot of your, your processing because uh, you don't have to worry about things like that. Yeah, we're, we're actually not doing transactions right now. I was just curious if you had any recommendations how to achieve, tra I mean, basically just re-implementing the two-phase commit protocol on, on, on all of our pieces. Is that, is that essentially what it is? Um, um, well, I, th I think uh, you'd have to implement a, a lot to, to get to the same complexity that, that Apache Kafka has done. But if you're if you're comfortable with uh, like yeah, the, like you basically have to read the Kafka improvement proposals where they design Kafka transactions and see where the differences lie. Uh, there there could be a lot. So I don't have a specific kind of easy answer for you, unfortunately. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Okay. That's that's all I I have time for. So thank you.